Good evening for Europeans. Good morning, good afternoon for you guys in the United States. This is Francesco here from the Perbacco Wine Club and from the Osteria del Borgo in Montepulciano, Italy. Tonight we have a beautiful event of you know, some wines that I personally love from two incredible, incredible regions of Italy, Sicily and Sardinia. I'm so glad to introduce these regions that don't usually get enough credit, especially overseas. We drink a lot of Sicilian wine and Sardinian white wine in Italy, but when I go abroad, I don't see often wines from these two incredible regions. So I'm very happy to, you know, spread the word and to help you guys to get to know these two beautiful, beautiful regions. So the first event of this small series of online tastings that we'll be doing in May and June, for uh, in May and June. So the first one is Sicily and Sardinia. The second one is gonna be is gonna take place on Sunday, June thirteenth, and it's gonna be Italian uh, white wines and orange wines. And the third one is gonna be on Sunday, June the twentieth, and it's gonna be Italian sparkling wines. So in the next tasting, in the up upcoming tastings, we'll learn on the first one, the difference in between white wines and orange wines. So many people ask me, what is an orange wine? Is it a, is it a wine made out of oranges? No, it is made out of grapes. It is a wine at all effect, but it's going to be very interesting to find out how it is made and how good it is. On the last tasting, we'll be learning about the difference in the differences in between uh, Prosecco method and champenoise champagne method through Italian wines. You know, there's two methods for making sparkling wines. The first one is fermentation in the big tanks, and the second one is fermentation in the bottle. So very, very interesting events for this upcoming, you know, June as well. So I'm very happy to share these beautiful wines with you guys. So uh, for the ones that don't know me, we have a few friends in, uh, Rhode Island and Utah, all over the place in the US, Germany. Most of you guys know me already. Uh, for the ones that don't know me, uh, I run the Perbacco Wine Club, which is this amazing uh, wine club based in Montepulciano, Italy. So I'm happy to organize this kind of events. It is much fun, much more fun to organize events like here in Italy or to travel and to go to the United States, bring our wines and taste them together that's more fun to share it, to share the wines with you live in, in person. But for the moment, until this stupid COVID is gonna you know, pass away, we have to do this live. And I'm very happy to be live with you guys too. Okay, I'm gonna make a, an introduction, which is gonna last about probably 25 minutes, 30 minutes. I'll try to keep it shorter. I tend to talk a lot as you guys have noticed already for sure. Um, I'm going to make an introduction about Sicily and Sardinia as wine regions, also a little bit of history background, and then we're going to do the online tasting, and you guys feel free to intervene, to chat with me anytime. I'm going to be alone tonight because Mary is busy at the wine, at the wine bar because luckily Montepulciano started to be, you know, to, to have a few people buzzing around and we started to be busy and we're very glad, we're very glad about this. Uh, so Mary is busy and my whole family is busy at the restaurant that luckily is starting to work again. We started to go back to our stressful everyday, you know, daily routine with the restaurant and the wine bar. We're so happy to be back to work. Uh, and it's, it's, it is, it is a beautiful feeling. Okay. I'm going to share the screen. We go, we start with the presentation. All righty. So you should see, move this down, there you go. Yeah, this is it, Sicily and Sardinia, Mediterranean Soul. The presentation was done by me on behalf of the Perbaco, of the Perbaco Wine Club. So you see the background, this beautiful Greek temple that is not in Greece, Nula and Michael, you guys have been, Nula is from Greece and Michael online with us has been living in Greece for a while. We are not in Greece, 
we are in Sicily, in Agrigento, in the Valley of the Temples, because Sicily has had many influences within, within the centuries. So Sicily, a stunning melting pot of cultures, history, and natural beauty, more than 3,000 years of history. So there are archaeological evidence that suggests that winemaking in Sicily dates back to the fourth millennium before Christ. A melting pot of different cultures, Sicily has had influences of the Phoenicians in the 11th century before Christ, of the Greeks, the 8th century before Christ, and the Romans in the second century before Christ. These three civilizations were crucial for Sicilian culture and for Sicilian wine. There's many traces before the Phoenicians as well, but the Phoenicians are the ones. Oh, hello, Vince. Vince from North Carolina with us. Welcome into the tasting. So as I was saying, the Phoenicians were very important. They kind of stepped up the game for Sicilian wine because they were incredibly good sailors and they were trading a lot and they were growing a lot of wine in Sicily. They saw the potential of Sicily as winemaking region. So they stepped up the game in the winemaking process. The Greeks, obviously, they loved their wines, many poets and many, uh, many pottery and jewelry from, the old, from old Greece has traces of wine and the Romans loved their wines too. So this three civilization, they brought, you know, they stepped up the game, each one of them, until the turbulent dominations of the Byzantines, the Muslims, and the Normans. So these three civilizations were not interested into wine whatsoever. So the Byzantine period was a very dark age because when the Roman Empire fell, the Byzantines were took over and you know the Roman Empire was pretty messed up after the Roman domination. Rome was dominating the whole you know known world and the Byzantine the Byzantines era was pretty dark time as well. The Muslims obviously they had no interest in alcoholic beverages and the Normans as well they came from Germany and they were not, not interested in, in, in wine. So from the 14th century after, after Christ, with the Aragonese domination, so the Spanish domination, they were dominating the south, the south of Italy, Sicily and its wine lived the period of Renaissance. Another crucial date is the 70, 1770s, in which the popularity of Marsala put Sicily on the map, on the map of European viticulture until the devastating wine plague of the 19th century. So the wine plug of, on the 19th century for the ones that were on the previous uh, uh, wine tastings was the phylloxera. Phylloxera was, is, is still nowadays, it is a disease that affects the vines. An insect original, originally born in America that when technology was more advanced and the boats from America until Europe were having shorter journeys, these in, insects, this insect, Phylloxera, started to survive these journeys in between America and Europe. So when it arrived to Europe, it started spreading and killing 99% of the vines all over Europe. So it was a devastation. Europe hasn't been making wine for over 20, 30 years. It took a lot of, it took two, three decades to recover uh, from this huge, huge plaque. So, you know, Sicily was affected by it too. But as I say, only 99% of the vines were killed. 1% of the vines survived. Most of, them, most of them were in Sicily. And we will find out where they were and why they survived this insect. From the 1970s, Sicily became one of the most important, diversified and dynamic when making regions of the world. You see the stunning beauty of uh, Sicily. My computer is very slow, <laughs> so it doesn't charge. It doesn't uh, charge the uh, videos. Still buffering, but anyway, this is the Valley of the Temples in Agrigento, which is one of the most unbelievable places. Very similar to Greece, of course. 
the Acropolis from Athens is stunning, but also this part of the world is pretty beautiful and was built during the Greek domination, of course, when Sicily was the cultural center of the Magna Grecia. Magna Grecia was the Magna Grecia, was the Greek uh, civilization living in the south of Italy. This right here is the beautiful center of the city of Catania, and this right here, the beautiful center of the city of Palermo, you know, 16th, 17th century. Beautiful region. Of course, I cannot mention, you know, I have to mention the amazing food in Sicily. Here you have amazing arancini with rice. They can be like this, steamed rice or deep fried, which are my absolutely my absolute favorite. Pasta, of course, pasta la norma with eggplants, amazing. This is cassata, amazing dessert. And this is, of course, cannoli. So Sicilians, they have probably the best pastry in Italy, if not the best pastry in the world. So amazing food in Sicily. But also wine is pretty amazing too. So one of the most diverse wine regions Sicily, with its wide range of local grapes and climates, offers one of the most fascinating and diverse scenarios. Known in the past for a high yield production and for being the land of Marsala wine, the region has recently discovered fine quality wines and has quickly made it to the top of the world's most important wine regions. On the background, you see these beautiful small vines from Pantelleria, coming from one of the wines that we'll be tasting, the last wine. That we'll be tasting. Sicilian wine regions, Etna. You see, probably you hear the noise on the background because I didn't deactivate it, but it's it's a beautiful thing. We are obviously live. <laughs> you see this noise, it's the active volcano. So Etna is a still active volcano, still in activity as I speak now. The last eruption started in mid-February and is still lasting. So there's still volcanic activity. And it looks like this, like you guys see in the background with steam, with fire, it, it's, it's with the whole lava thing. It is pretty impressive. And you just hear it roaring when you're there. Amazing, amazing, you know, natural uh, beauty. So we're pretty high up in altitude, 3,350 meters above sea level, around 11,000 feet. We're talking of, as I said, as I mentioned, one of the world's most active volcanoes, which obviously gives uh, volcanic soil, which is a perfect habitat for vines. So why is it a perfect habitat for, for vines? Because uh, for vines, vines, they thrive in difficult conditions. So the poorer the soil is, and the more the vines are challenged to go underground to get the good minerals from the soil. Also, being really high up in altitude, they have cool climate, much cooler climate. We'll find out how, di how different the wines from Etna are from the rest of the wines from, from Sicily. You have ventilation. So you don't develop any molds or any diseases in the vines. Temperature swings are ideal for the uh, development of aromatic compounds and minerality that give this beautiful savoriness to the wine. So you have old vines more than 120 years old. Some of them, they are pre-phylloxera vines. They survived the vine plague in the 19th century, which is pretty, it is pretty, unbelievable if you think about it to have 120 years old vines because they have a much longer life in here because the vines are challenged to go really down into the soil you have a lot of local varieties mostly in in ethna most of the wines are made with local varieties you have amazing reds white roses and sparkling wines as well on the last tasting we'll taste a sparkling wine from ethna which is pretty amazing at the white region the southeast usually you have Nero Davola, Frappato and Grillo, these kind of local varietals, usually known for great values wine because they have really generous yields. The climate is obviously the opposite of Etna, warm and, warm and dry. And the wines are structure, structured reds, yet very smooth and very, and very pleasant. So, yep, 
another wine region is the western sicily we'll taste one wine the third wine is from western sicily marzala obviously one of the most popular wines for over 200 years marzala in the 19th century and the beginning of 20th century, if you mentioned uh, Italian wine abroad, 99% of the people that will reply saying that the Italian wine was Marzala, because it was the, one of the main wines that you could find uh, overseas. It was invented by a British um, merchant and sailor. Beautiful story, very fascinating. So this guy, John Woodhouse, arrived in the port of Marza, of Trapani, and he tasted the dessert, this dessert wine, and he loved it. And he saw the potential uh, to sell this wine in the market in the, uh, in, in, in the UK. And, but to make sure that the wine would survive from Marzala, would survive the journey up until... Um, Liverpool in the 1770s, where the boats were very slow, he added some brandy. So this wine is a fortified wine. And when he arrived, he showed up in Liverpool with this amazing fortified wine. People loved it. And the popularity of Marzala reached the one of Sherry, Port, and Madeira wine. These are the main, most important fortified wines in the world. Then in the 1830s, the Florio family with Vincenzo Florio, they stepped up the game in the production of Marzala. Warm and dry climate, we'll taste a wine that is pretty full body, structured reds with surprisingly fresh whites because you have mountains as well. And together with Etna, the most fascinating region of Italy, I think is the islands of Sardinia. Amazing volcanic islands, really small production, with really, really high quality, high quality wines. You have volcanic soils with slopes, very deep slopes and big ventilation because you're close to the sea. Of course, uh, volcanic soils because those, these are volcanic, volcanic islands. So you have very, very, very savory wines as well here. Uncontaminated islands, beautiful, beautiful, spectacular, um, unfiltered beauty of the beaches of the islands. Here you have Passito di Pantelleria, which is going to be our grand finale, and Malvasia delle Lipari. Next one is Sardinia. Do you guys have any questions by, by the way? I'm going to interrupt just a little bit because as I told you, just myself. Do you have any question? I open the chat. No? OK. I'm gonna go with the presentation of Sardinia. Sardinia, unfiltered beauty. See the crystal clear water of this beautiful beach in Sardinia. This is spectacular. I haven't been in holiday for one and a half years. When I see these, this is torturing me. I just wanna dive in the screen right now. So Sardinia is, rich in history, culture, and also natural beauty like Sicily. So famous for some of the most beautiful and uncontaminated beaches in Europe, Sardinia has also a long history of winemaking that dates back to the second millennium before Christ. So from the Nuragic civilizations in Bronze Age, the 15th century before Christ, so 3,500 years ago, winemaking was an important part of the local economy and everyday life. Then with the Phoenicians as well, and the Romans, domination, of course, new technique were implemented. And they, like they did for Sardinia, they brought in new techniques and new, more modern, you know, uh, skills for into winemaking. Now Sardinia is the last, the land of important local grape varietals such as Canonau, Bovale, and Carignano. And we will taste them all. See the natural beauty in Sardinia. Beautiful. The water is just very similar to the one in the Caribbeans or in the Maldives. Just uh, this is the place where Italians go in holiday. This is a beautiful building from the Nuragic civilizations. These uh, buildings made with stones, very similar to the temples that you can find in Mexico as well. Uh, very fascinating culture. More than you know, Bronze Age, more than two thousand five, uh, three thousand five. 100 years 
old, very fascinating. And this is the city of Cagliari. Sardinia is worldwide popular for the pecorino cheese, cheese in all form. So this is gonna be very gross, especially here. Uh, I'm gonna tell you, I don't wanna gross you guys out, uh, but this is very popular in Sardinia and they're so proud of this kind of cheese. This is called Caso Marzo in, Sicilian, in Sardinian dialect, which means rotten cheese made with worms. These are worms, you know, these are worms and then they will turn into ugly flies. And they go into this cheese and they just rot it from the inside. And the result is this cheese that smells from kilometers apart. <laughs> and apparently they love it. If you go there and you don't taste this, they will get, you, you really offend them. They will get offended because they're so proud of this cheese. Is, and apparently is amazing. I haven't had, I haven't dared to try already. But you see cold cuts, they have a lot of lamb, they have a lot of meat as well, and beautiful, beautiful cheeses. So yeah, Sardinia, Sardinian wines, strong personality. Sardinia is a land with a strong and defined personality. Sardinians can be stubborn, trust me, I have a lot of friends from Sardinia, straightforward, yet extremely loyal and hospitable friends. So both their foods, especially the cheese that I showed you before, and wines have a strong flavor and a fulfilling taste, fulfilling aroma. There is no middle ground with Sardinia and with Sardinians. But once you open your heart to this great land, it will leave you speechless. So the common thing in between Sardinian foods and Sardinian wine is this strong flavors, very defined, character. So once you open your heart and your mind to these beautiful flavors, you fall in love with it. It's beautiful. Donkey living the dream in the heart of Sardinia here. And yeah, these are the wine regions. We are mostly focusing on the south uh, west winemaking region, which is the top winemaking region. We taste the probably the two best wines from Sardinia. Here the wine lineup. The first one is going to be Cotta Nera Calderara, Etna Bianco DOC 2018. Second one from the same winery, the Etna Red. The third one, Donna Fugata Tancredi, IGT 2017. Then Argiolas, uh, Argiolas Corem Rosso, IGT 2017. And then Agripunica Barrua. And the last one is going to be the dessert wine from Donna Fugata. Here we are. I should see my face again. Here I am. Do you guys have any questions? Do you guys want to be online? I know we start tripping. Uh, I can hey, hear someone. Francesco, I do have a question. Can you hear me? I can hear you. You can also activate your video as well. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. I was just wondering, you said it says unable to start video. It said, um, you said Marsala has been the most popular wine in over 200 years. I didn't know that. That like currently? Uh, well, no, B back in the days, probably in the late 18th century, nine, whole 19th century and uh, most of the 20th century as well, especially in the beginning. Marsala, <laughs> Marsala was incredibly popular, especially in Europe and especially in and especially in in the UK as well, it was very popular. Oh yeah, oh. now I can see you. I can. See. Thank you. I just wondered that. I was like, that is news to me. Like I thought you were talking about into the modern day. Okay. Yeah, yeah, more. Yeah, in the modern day, I think Barolo and Brunello and Super Tuscans and this guy here, Sassicaia. <laughs> These are kind of the most popular, the most popular wines. But Marzala has been a few, the fearless leader of Italian wines back in the days, you know, because red wines and white wines were usually the most popular ones. And sparkling wines were from France. Italy was seen, especially in the UK and in Northern Europe, was seen as this exotic kind of land where you will get the best dessert wines and the best fortified wines together with port and Madeira and sherry as well. So yeah, very interesting aspect in history of, of wine. Yep. Okay, 
we can go with the we can go with the tasting. Do you guys want to be on the video? I can activate all of your guys' video. This is up to you. I can I'm gonna invite you all, and then you can whether accept or refuse to be online with me. Here we are. Okay. So we hello Janine. Hi. Hello, Vince. What's that? <laughs> Hi, guys. Okay, perfect. We go on with the first wine. There's a lot of light here. Cotanera, Etna, DOC, the white wine. Yep. I'll show you some technical details about, about this wine. Amazing, I love it. <laughs> I'm gonna share my screen. I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna show you some technical, some technical details about, about this. Okay, here we are. Perfect. So yeah, you see again <laughs> the video of the erupting volcano of Etna. So if you expect this next two wines from Etna to be powerful and full body, uh, that will get you wrong. Uh, it is pretty unbelievable to know that these two wines are made in what is the warmest probably region of all Italy. Sicily geographically is very close, very close to Africa. The last wine that we'll be tasting from the island of Lampedusa, of Pantelleria, sorry, it's much closer to Africa rather than the rest of Sicily. So we're almost in Africa, very dry weather. But Etna, it's different because as I told you, we are, you know, it's a mountain. It's more than 3,000 meters above sea level. This wine in particular from the Cotanera family, amazing family that, you know, was born and raised in, 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 in the slopes of the Etna volcano, a very traditional winery that is giving a big contribution uh, to the wine region using local grapes and employing, which is very important, local staff and in particular women. You guys that have been on the wine club for a while, you know that I personally believe that women have brought a different perspective into wine business in, in Italy. Because during the 60s, the 70s, the 80s of the past century, wine business was mainly men predominant. Then the wives, the daughters, the you know nieces, or just single enter, female, female entrepreneurs, they just took over and they brought in a new perspective, bringing new sensitivity to wine, bringing, for, for example, the biologic, the, the organic aspect into Italian wine. They were the first ones to bring this kind of change and to step up the game. I, I really believe they did a great job, especially in the 90s. And the Cotanera family, they're very proud and happy to employ mostly, mostly women. They are the, you know, the engine, the fuel in their engine of the winery. So technical details, just for a second. Grapes, 100% Carricante, which is a local grape. Amazing, beautiful, nice freshness and beautiful minerality and savoriness. Aging took place for 12 months. 40% of the wine was aged in French tonneau, 500 liters French oak, 60% in cement tanks. We'll find out what this 40% of oak, what different the wine, it, it makes into the wine. We're pretty high up in altitude, 780 meters above sea level. Soil is obviously volcanic. So, you know, mostly lava and clay. Bottles made 5,600. Average age of wine of vines is 45 years. Alcohol percentage, 12.5% and price is 32 euros. Okay, here we are. You see the wine usually see the color of it beautiful golden straw color with a beautiful light to it you see very luminous very nice actually when you look at the color of the glass most of the sommeliers look like this i prefer to just look into the glass like like a sniper you just look just 
in the middle of it to see the color. I'm a, you know, the, a wine sniper, but I kill, I don't kill people. I just kill glasses of wine and bottles. <laughs> okay, so the color is a beautiful golden straw color with beautiful lights. The beautiful lights, this beautiful, the fact that wine is luminous, you can see from here, uh, show signs of freshness. Just by looking at it, looking at the wine, uh, my taste buds are already throwing a party. I'm already salivating because I imagine there's gonna be acidity and beautiful freshness into the wine. Let's see the smell of it first. Mm. Yeah. Um, now I have a good temperature now, serving temperature about 12 Celsius, which I have no idea how many Fahrenheit. Uh, I'm terrible in conversion. But when I poured straight from the fridge, the first note was the mineral note of flint and crushed stone. If, if your wine is too cold, this is the predominant note that you're going to feel. But I feel, you know, I feel this kind of beautiful notes of uh, crushed stones and flint, typical of the lava, of typical of the lava soil. So beautiful mineral, mineral touch to it. Uh, once it, the wine opens up and it warms up a little bit, there's a, a beautiful, elegant bouquet with a citrusy note of uh, lemon flowers. Uh, it's not lemon because it's not that strong. It's just a hint of lemon flowers, uh, like citrus, like bergamot, also chamomile, uh, and a beautiful white, white peach. Yeah, like a white peach, like a crunchy white peach that we now start having peaches in, 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 in Tuscany. So, you know, not a perfectly ripe one, but, a, you know, a white peach and a touch of sage, beautiful herb, a touch of sage. See the, I'm not making this up. Probably I'm making this up. We'll never find out. Who knows? <laughs> okay, so let's taste this. Um, My heart is beating fast because I love this kind of wines. I love when wines, my, my, my palate, my taste, I love when wines are acidic, vibrant, um, even I would say cocky, if you excuse me the word, when they, you know, they have this beautiful mouth-watering freshness, especially in the beginning. Uh, then you can feel, you can feel this, you can feel the acidity in the beginning and then eat and soften a little bit. And this is the part that was aged in oak. The oak gives a little bit more of a buttery, creamy taste to it. Otherwise, probably the winemaker found out that if you would age the wine in stainless steel or just cement, the wine would be a little bit too aggressive. So he decided to in soften 40% of the wine with French oak, big bigger barrels, 500 liters. So I'm assuming that the winemaker made, made this choice, which is, in my opinion, gives a beautiful balance to the wine. Of course, you have acidity, the buttery side to it in the middle, and then um, a beautiful mineral, salty, savory, sapid finish to it, which is due, obviously, to the lava soil, to the volcanic soil this beautiful saltiness of, of, of the wine. It leaves also a beautiful feeling of citruses, like a beautiful, you feel like, you know, like lemon, lemon skin. It feels like being in holiday in Amalfi Coast as well. I have some lemon taste in, 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 in my mouth, but it's extremely, extremely pleasant. Uh, a wonderful white wine, which I think is ready to drink now, ready to be enjoyed now, but also this wine will surprise you if you forget this wine into, the, into your cellar. You drink it even 20 years from now. I think that you wouldn't be able to recognize the difference in between this wine and a German Riesling that has been aged for 20 years. 
And this is the beauty, the beauty of wines, because it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter where they, you know, geographically they are from. It doesn't matter what grapes do you use. Great wines, they all look similar to each other's. They have similar compounds, similar components, similar characteristics, especially when they age. So I think these within 10 years from now, 15 years from now, will still have this beautiful acidity, but also will be more mineral, similar to an aged Riesling with hints of fuel. It sounds very gross, oil, petrol, but this is what, you know, wines coming from mineral, very mineral soils, when they age, white wines, they have this kind of minerality that resembles to your old, my old Vespa. I have an old Vespa and it's exactly the same kind of smell. That's my Vespa pretty much, yeah. Extremely enjoyable white, yet very, very, very complex. I would pair this with grilled fish, like a smoked salmon, grilled, like sockeye salmon, grilled. I think this will be a perfect pairing. Mm. I think I'm gonna finish it. <laughs> during the first, if you guys were with me during the first tasting, when we did the Brunello 2015 last year, I was spitting everything. Now, just no shame anymore. Just, I just drink it all. <laughs> I, I think now we can go with the, with the red from Etna. Same winery, Cotta Nera, Etna DOC 2017, 17 Feudo di Mezzo. Etna is divided like, you know, in Burgundy, you have different village, different appellations. In Barolo, you have different crews, single vineyard. In Chianti, you have different municipalities. In, in Etna, you have different contradas. Contrada is a concept that goes in between, you know, the appellation and the crew, the single vineyard, because it's bigger than a crew, than a single vineyard, and smaller than an appellation. So, you know, Feudo di Mezzo is one of the most popular, one of the most important contradas in, in the Etna volcano. Let me get the glass and let me open the screen. Do you guys hear me well? Do you have any question about the first wine? No? We're good to go? Good to go. I'm going to share the screen and go with the, this is the white and this is the red. Okay, beautiful. There you go, Cotta Nera, Feudo di Mezzo, Etna Rosso, Red, DOC 2017. The grapes will be 100% Nerello Mascalese, which is the most important, the predominant grape in Etna. Another very surprising comparison for this wine is with Nebbiolo, very similar to Nebbiolo. So this wine might be very similar to Barolo, we, we, we will find out. Aging of this wine is 16 months in French oak casks. So they decided to choose to choose French oak because French oak, in comparing to Slovenian oak, is usually a little bit more gentle. So especially these wines, they have this minerality, which is very typical of the Etna wine. So the winemakers, they use French oak because otherwise Slovenian oak will be probably a little bit too straightforward. I'm just uh, I'm just assuming, but we'll taste this the second wine altitude similar to the first wine 750 between 750 780 meters this is meters not feet above sea level soil again is volcanic and clay bottles made 8000 average age of vines is 30 years old oh this thing alcohol percentage 14% and price is going to be 36 euros Again, yep. This is it. Okay. Beautiful, beautiful color as well. Very nice. Um, like a luminous ruby with garnet reflections as well. Uh, garnet uh, reflection as well. So this garnet color, uh, I don't know if you have. How much light do you have in here? I don't know if you see. Well, you see it in your glass. 
why am I showing, why am I doing all this? I look like stupid. I am stupid, but anyway. So this kind of color reminds me a lot of a young Barolo or a Barbaresco. Nerello Mascalese, which is the grape we're tasting now, is very similar to Nebbiolo in many aspects. Yep. Uh, the color, you know, it, it looks like a Barolo. I'm, I'm, I'm very surprised to see the color, this kind of color uh, from a wine from Sicily. Very interesting. Uh, another luminous color, so you would expect freshness from this. It's a wine, you know, made in altitudes. Let's see the nose. I smell it the first times with a steel glass and then I just swirl it because some compounds are heavier. So they just need a little bit of a swirl to just uh, open up. Beautiful, another, same as the first one, quintessential elegance to it. Uh, beautiful finesse, um, a beautiful like floral character to it of wild rose again these uh, wild rose uh, violet flower um, aspect is reminds me a lot of a good barolo and a good barbaresco very very similar i'm i'm, I'm very surprised i think 90% uh, of experienced and skilled sommeliers they will have a hard time and a blind tasting to distinguish this wine from a Barolo and Barbaresco. Yeah. Yeah, this beautiful aspect there of wild rose. Uh, then if you swirl it, you have a beautiful fruit like uh, red currant and raspberry. Raspberry, yeah. Beautiful but balsamic notes of eucalyptus. And uh, Kind of a, it's not dusty, but uh, a beautiful note of, again, of crushed stones and of graphite as well. You know, graphite is, you know, like a pencil. If you have the memories from kindergarten or primary school, when you open the pencil case and you have this smell of graphite, I, I smell a little bit of it here, which is extremely pleasant. All the scents, all the you know, smells are uh, beautifully balanced and in a beautiful symphony, like in a beautiful or or orchestra, all the instruments, they're just perfectly blending together. Uh, beautiful finesse, beautiful, beautiful wine. Let's see the palate, if it shows the same quality. Wow, very fresh, vibrant, beautiful acidity as well. If you have something to eat now, probably like a, you know, like a cheese or like a salami slice or um, or ham, eat it with it because these make you make you salivate a lot. Sounds very gross, but it gives a lot of succulence into your into your mouth, and this is because of the acidity which is due to the altitude and to the young age as well. And also this beautiful savoriness, this beautiful minerality, which is due to the soil. So you have a grippy tannin as well. The wine is tannic. So you have a beginning of freshness, this overwhelming acidity. Then you have this tannin, which is firm and grippy. Again, many similarities with Barolos, many similarities with Barolos and a long lasting savory, savory finish. Probably this wine hasn't reached its potential. I like it now because I like when wine is vibrant and it's got a lot of life, very joyful. But I think this wine will reach the peak within five years and it can, it can last for 20 years easily, you know. But overall, I just love this wine. I think it's extremely high, extremely high quality. Probably it's not that ready to drink, not as ready as the first one, not as ready as the following ones. But I think the quality of this wine is just spectacular. I just love it. Yeah, about wine pairing with this, I think, food pairing, I think, hard cheese, uh, 
salami and also red meat in general, uh, like us too. Do you guys have any questions on the second wine from Etna? Or about Etna in general, about Etna terroir in general? If you guys have any questions, just feel free to ask. Otherwise, we go to the third wine. Are we good to go with the third one, guys? Say yes. Amazing. Am I talking too much? Am I boring you guys too much? Pardon me if I'm boring. Uh, at least I'm so beautiful and good looking. So I'm a joy for the eyes, if not for the ears. <laughs> All jokes aside. Uh, Third wine, ta-da, Tancredi, oh, the light sucks, Tancredi from 2017 from Donna Fugata, yeah, this is the back, Donna Fugata is one of the most important wineries, not just in Sicily, but in Italy, one of the most important winemaking, winemaking groups. Uh, we're gonna taste two wines from Donna Fugata, which is this one and the last one, the dessert wine. Yeah, I'm gonna share my screen so I'll give you more information. Okay, we are in physically on the opposite side of Sicily. Etna is here. This is you know this is the part that is close to Italy. This is the south of Italy, Calabria. Here you have, on this side of the screen where I'm pointing now, you have Africa. And here, you know, it's the Western wine region of Sicily, famous for the Marsala. Yeah, here you find Marsala City. And this is the wine, the so-called wine region of Western Sicily. You see the beautiful landscape. It looks a lot like, um, like Tuscany as well. Okay. There we are. These guys, these folks are the Rallo family. The Rallo family, very important family that started the winery in the uh, early 1980s. They have become one of the most important family in the wine, in the wine business, as I said, not just for Sicily, but not just for the region, but for the whole country. You see beautiful soils as well. You have different kinds of soils because even in the inland of Sardinia, you have a lot of volcanic, uh, of volcanic soils, of volcanic compounds on the, on the soil because it's a volcanic land. It's always been volcanic. All the islands in Sicily are volcanic. And Sicily is an island by itself and mostly made with volcanic, uh, volcanic, uh, um, volcanic compounds in the soil. Yeah, here it is. A few technical information about the wine. Donna Fugata, Tancredi, Terre Siciliane, IGT 2017. So lots of grapes, mostly Nero, Dav Nero Davola, which is the predominant grape, Cabernet Sauvignon and Tannat. I, the first time in my life that I see Tannat cultivated in Italy into a wine, because usually Tannat is from France, a uh, very strong, powerful wine with big concentration and big tannins as well. Uh, it's going to be very, very interesting to taste this wine. Aging, 14 months in French oak barrels, 250 liters. Both, they use both old and new barrels. Altitudes can vary in between 2000, uh, 200, sorry, and 400 meters above sea level. Soil, soil is clay, loam, limestone, and rocky soil beautiful rocks that, you know, rocks are very important because they accumulate the heat during the day and they release it at night. So it's very important to have rocky soils in, 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 in the vineyards for a high quality wine as well. Average age of vines, 20 to 40 years, alcohol percentage, they were so precise, they put 13.66. Price is 38 euros. Okay. Go back to my ugly face. Yeah, you see the color of this one compared to the second one. I think the second glass 
you see the different you wouldn't believe that these are made you know in the same in the same region in the same island but here you see the first one this color very bright and this looks like ink it's very deep extraordinary deep color uh, almost like with the purple purple reflexes as well highly concentrated i'm assuming by the color that we'll be tasting something that has a bigger impact a wine that is more muscular i'm just assuming by the color i'm cheating a little bit because i've tasted the wines already yesterday and two days ago but uh anyway <laughs> so let's see the nose of this the smell yeah uh much more intense than the previous red the previous red was very elegant so intensity from a sommelier from a tasting perspective is when you when you have low intensity like in the second wine in the first red i cannot smell it from here i have to put my nose into the glass to smell it so lower intensity it doesn't mean that the quality is worse or better it's just different intensity while this one is more immediate has got much higher intensity because i can smell it from apart from far away yep so yeah i can you know imagine a big structure because the there's a big intensity almost like overwhelming intensity of this jammy character jammy aspect to it like red berries jam a plum plum plums jam yeah with notes of dried flowers and uh, beautiful balsamic notes of sage and eucalyptus as well and an aspect like a chocolatey aspect to it of like cocoa or dark chocolate as well yeah the nero davola give, gives a big contribution in terms of intensity of color and intensity of aromas with this fruity side the nero davola the typical grape from 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 sicily while the cabernet sauvignon gives this spicy note of cocoa and 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 like a tobacco like a sweet tobacco side to it very muscular bouquet but beautiful complexity pretty wide as well because uh, usually you know intensity doesn't match really well with complexity so the more intense the wines are and the less complex they usually are but this is both intense and complex which is a beautiful sign uh, i'm very optimistic about tasting this one but taste it wow extremely powerful generals uh warm you have the warmth of the on this one compared to the previous wine completely completely different the previous wine looked like uh, barolo on a cool vintage or also very similar to a Pinot Noir from New Zealand. You see the difference in between Sicily and New Zealand is huge, but it looked like almost like a Pinot Noir from New Zealand. This one, boom, big impact into your, you know, my taste buds are just in buffering, I'm buffering now because it's still processing the wine. You know, the taste buds are just overwhelmed. They don't know what to do. They don't know what they're tasting very well. So I need the second sip. Yeah, I have to say the wine has a big structure, but still extremely balanced. There's a beautiful balance to it, which is very surprising because when you see this wine, you expect something a little bit too heavy, probably, but nice, vibrant, also beautiful acidity as well. Very well balanced uh, with a mineral finish with this kind of beautiful savoriness at the beginning, at the end. Uh, tannins are firm because you you, I can feel the tannins in my gums, in my lips, in my tongue as well. Tannins is, again, for the ones that don't know what tannins are, tannins are a polyphenol. They give that kind of bitterness that you taste, in, especially in red wines. So similar, sometimes you, you taste a red wine that is, you know, is very bitter and it dries your uh, taste buds. 
that's because it's probably high on tendons. So the tendons are firm, but beautifully integrated with the structure. I have a beautiful, as I say, savory finish, a long persistence of red fruits in my mouth. You know, my taste buds are throwing a party with this beautiful um, raspberry and this kind of uh, black cherry, black cherry aspect of this wine, these beautiful flavors that are is still in my palate after, you know, I've drank, uh, I've, I've, I've had the wine already a, a, a few seconds ago. I'm surprised by the overall balance of this wine. I didn't expect it to be so neat and so balanced. Um, I love it. I love this wine very much. I was happily deceived by the appearance of this wine. I was expecting something heavy, but the wine is beautiful, clean, neat, and perfect. So I think the perfect pairing with this one, with this beautiful body and this alcohol will be a T-bone steak or probably a meat preparation with mushrooms on it. Uh, I think will be a good pairing. Before we go to Sardinia, do you guys have any questions? Let's see if there's any questions on Facebook. I'm doing everything by myself and I'm terrible, terrible with technology. I have like five screens where I see my face in all of them and it's so creepy. I look like my own big brother. Okay, not my, not my actual brother, the big brother in, like in George Orwell uh, book. <laughs> I don't want my brother to be offended by this. Any questions, you guys? We okay? Neat. Janine, are we okay? Are you guys in Rhode Island or Florida? Rhode Island? Hello, Rhode Island, out there. <laughs> you see my beautiful friends from Utah as well. With, with, yeah, with these guys, I love you guys. With these guys, we've had one of the most epic weeks in September 2019 before this COVID disaster. We had a beautiful week of wine tastings. We had so much fun with these guys. We were, my, my, my best memories were when we went to, uh, to Montalcino and you guys were singing in the bus. It was like a school trip, you know, visiting the wineries. Uh, I, I miss that. I miss having you guys here. I miss having, doing this kind of tasting live with you people, being able, you know, to hug you, to just, you know, drink together and to share beautiful moments and beautiful memories. Michael and Nula, they, of course, you guys, you guys were here in September last year. So you're privileged because you live in Germany. So you're very close by. And I'm sure I'll, I'll meet you this summer, right? Beautiful. And all the guys online as well, we have, let's see what we have online. Oh uh, yeah, my 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 brother from another mother in 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 North Carolina in Apex or actually uh, Riley area, Vince in Candance as well. Uh, we have we have we have Christopher and Annette from from Georgia from Atlanta. Hello, Chris. Hello, Annette. Greetings. Hello. Greetings. Hello. Hello. Yeah, Chris is there. <laughs> I can I can hear you. Yeah, oh yeah, you say the law. Yeah, we have a lot of friends that will be seeing this in the next few days because they couldn't be here today. So I will send the recorded the recorded version of the tasting that obviously I forgot to record on Zoom. I'm now recording on Zoom, <laughs> uh, but I, I'm, I'm recording on Facebook as well. So we are live on Facebook as well. Hello again, Chinese and Russian government. How are you guys doing? Hello, KGB. Hello. <laughs> Just me being silly. Uh, yeah, we have a few groups that will be with us in the next days that will watch the recorded, the recorded version. Okay. Let's go on to the fourth wine. Here we are in Sardinia. Let me grab the 
glass and the bottle as well. So Sardinia is another another beautiful island. Well, again, we're talking about regions of Italy. Uh, it's reductive to call them regions because there are two islands in the heart of the Mediterranean. Sicily is the biggest island of the Mediterranean Sea, and I'm sure about this. Probably Sardinia is the second biggest, biggest island. Probably Nula has more information. I don't know about Cyprus, probably, or but probably Cyprus and uh, Sardinia are the second and the third biggest islands in the Mediterranean Sea. So we are in the heart of the Mediterranean. Completely different climate from the rest of Italy, as we saw in the first and uh, the first three wines. And Sardinia has a very similar climate to the inland of Sicily. So warm and dry climate. We are in the south of Sardinia, this beautiful, beautiful island. You see on the background this construction. This is called, again, like I said before, Nurage from the Bronze Age, more than 3,500 years old, pretty impressive. Yeah, and here are a few pictures of the Argiolas, Argiolas, probably with the with their um, in their dialect in their accent, family. Beautiful landscape. See hardworking people, um, and these are the Argiolas, Argiolas brothers that are now running the winery. The winery that is, you know, more than ninety years old. See a few technical infos about the wine. Argiolas Corem Rosso IGT 2017. Grapes are the three most important local grapes of Sardinia. Bovale, 85% local grape. Carignano, the predominant grape in Sardinia, 10%. And Canonau, 5%. Canonau is a Sardinian variety of Grenache. They're very proud of Cano now because on the on the eastern uh, coast they make mostly red wines with Cano now. Here there's just a small, small percentage of it. Again, we have French oak, French barrique, aging is 12 months in French oak, altitude in between 200 and 250 meters above sea level. Uh, soil is limestone and clay. The winery is active in, since 1938, the first vintage of this particular wine is from 1997. Average age of vines is 35 years and alcohol percentage, pretty high alcohol percentage, 14.5 and price is 42 euros. That's my ugly face again. This is the wine I haven't shown the, the label, yeah, Corem 2017, Bovale, the name of the main grape, uh, Isola dei Nuraghi, Argiolas. Isola dei Nuraghi means island of the Nuragis. The Nuragis were the people, civiliz civilization living in Sardinia 3,000 years ago. Okay. Yeah, the Argiolas family, as I said, very Sardinian people in general. I have a lot of friend, friends from Sardinia. The most uh, hospitable and welcoming people in the world, probably. If you go to their house, they will get you drunk because they will pour wine over wine and you have to drink it, you have no choice. Otherwise, you will offend them. They will give you food, especially that cheese with worms that we saw before. That is something that, if I'm sure, uh, if I'm sure about something in my life, then I will never taste that cheese. I'm not a cheese person, but that cheese, I will never eat it. Not even if they torture, not even if Isis come, comes to multiple channel and they feed me that cheese, I will say no, thank you. Okay, so here we are. Yeah. The color, another intense red ruby color with a pretty thick, thick texture. I can imagine, I can suppose that this is gonna be full bodied as well big concentration of the fruits and of the aromatic compounds and probably alcohol as well. Usually this is something that many people focus and they give more important than what it actually has, the legs. Legs are very important for us so we can walk without issues. 
The legs are not that important in wine, but they show you the percentage of alcohol in the wine. So the closer, you don't see them very well, but the closer the legs, the more the alcohol percentage it is. If you see, if you take brandy or scotch or whiskey or rum, and you swirl the glass, you see that the legs are very close to each other because the alcohol percentage is higher. So the legs are pretty close. So I can imagine by, you know, I've, I've already spoiled the whole grand finale, but the alcohol percentage is 14.5%. So pretty high in alcohol, but I can assume by looking at the legs, but you don't have to focus on the legs of the glass very much. Okay, so yeah, the nose. Another wine of great intensity, like the previous one. Great intensity, I can smell it from apart. Uh, good complexity as well, really good complexity because I, I have, I'm smelling different layers to this wine. It's not just the fruit that comes, you know, it's just, just in, in my mind at the beginning, it hits me, but different layers. Okay, so obviously fruit, this ripe black currant, uh, this cassis, this maraschino, maraschino cherry, this like cherry under spirit, these uh, dried flowers, like a potpourri dried, of dried flowers. Then there, there are different layers like this, um, elegant and beautiful note that I like a lot in this wine is this black chocolate. Very chocolatey aspect to it. Also tobacco. And a beautiful touch of uh, Mediterranean scrub, Mediterranean scrub like rosemary, sage, um, mostly rosemary. Mediterranean scrub is a smell that I always associate with Sardinia because I've been to Sardinia three times, two times in summertime because Sardinia is the place where we usually, we Italians, we go on vacation in Sardinia because it's got the most beautiful, I don't like to say that word because my Italian accent makes it terrible, but the most beautiful beaches in Italy are in, in, in Sardinia. So, yeah, the Mediterranean scrub is something that I associate with Sardinia always. So I have a, reminds me a lot of Sardinia. Probably it's my mind, mind is playing this kind of game because I'm a, I already know that this wine is from Sardinia. I'm, I'm associating the wine with some, the smells from Sardinia, but this, this is just my silly thing. Okay, so beautiful bouquet, very powerful and elegant. See the palette? as well as the previous one, warm, structured, very powerful, yet balanced um, with um, a peak and um, velvety and warm beginning. I feel the alcohol in the beginning. The presence of this, you know, muscular structure of this wine, but then again, progressive freshness, that keeps all the compounds together in a beautiful, beautiful, perfect balance. At the end, I have a robust tannin, uh, which is strong and marked tannin, but still creamy. It's not too aggressive. It's pretty creamy. I have it in my lips, in my gums as well. And a good savoriness as well, pretty mineral as well, pretty salty as well. And it leaves a sensation, an effluvium of, uh, fruits of I'm I'm now it's like I'm chewing black currants berries a little bit of licorice as well extremely extremely pleasant extremely balanced I like this wine a lot so uh, as I said before Sardinia is a land you know Sardinian Sardinians uh, they have a strong personality uh, Sardinians have a strong personality also their food has a strong personality and their wines have a strong personality as well. Uh, but this wine has a strong personality, but beautiful balance at the same time. Very, very, very interesting. And I like this wine, this wine a lot. Of course, I've chosen all these wines for the wine tasting. So 
you know, I obviously like them all. But yeah, great wine indeed. This is good to drink now. I think this will form a perfect uh, food pairing with white boar, game, and uh, dark uh, heart, uh, heart cheese. But also, surprisingly, I think this can go really well with black chocolate. I think as a meditation wine with dark, dark chocolate, like dry chocolate, this will go really well because also this chocolatey aspect reminds of chocolate and I think it will be a beautiful, a beautiful pairing. Yeah. Hey, Vince. Hey, guys. Oh, that was great. That's Riley there. Yeah, because we have Vince and Malia from Salt Lake City, from Draper, actually. And then we have Vince and Candence from North Carolina. Hi, guys. And see. Great to see you guys. Do you guys have any questions about the tasting in general, the wines? Just feel free to ask anything you guys need to know. No questions. Let's see our chat. Let's see our Facebook. Here we are. This is us on Facebook. This is what we look like in social media. The whole world is seeing us. <laughs> I'm just fascinated by technology in general. Just still, you know, we live in multiple channels. It's like living in a medieval Renaissance town. So technology is new to me. We are, we have horses and charts. We don't have cars here. So everything about technology is amazing me. Okay, we can go with the, are we on the fifth wine already? I need to make some space here. Okay. Fifth wine. This is the most popular and most important wine from Sardinia. So if you don't like this wine, I don't know what I can offer from Sardinia because this is the top of Sardinia. This is like the Ferrari of Sardinia. Actually, they call this wine the Sassicaia of Sardinia. Sassicaia is the most important super Tuscan that we have in Tuscany. It's actually this guy here that you see. You see this case of Sassicaia on my left? And the wine was made by the same people, by the same winemaker and by the same owner of the winery in a beautiful, beautiful project. But now I will tell you something about. I shared the screen again. Okie dokie. Yeah, here we are. This is the beautiful inland of Sardinia because Sardinia is obviously known for the beautiful beaches that he has for, especially here on this side and on the northern side. This side is famous for clubs. So if you want to go to a club, if you want to party at the discotheque, you should go in this part of Sardinia. While if you are into red wines, you should stay, you should stick around this area close to Cagliari. Yeah. Beautiful, beautiful landscape. Here we are. Who are these three guys? These three guys, I don't know. Some of you guys have done the Super Tuscan tasting in November. I think the guys from Riley, North Carolina, they did the tasting in November. When I mentioned the Super Tuscans, I mentioned the guys that pretty much invented the concept of Super Tuscan. The guys that invented the wine, Sassicaia, the one that I was mentioning before. So the three men behind the legend, behind the wine that we are tasting now, you have Mr. Antonello Pilloni, a local wine entrepreneur, the visioner, Mr. Giacomo Takis, the wine guru, the most important winemaker in the history of Italian wine, and the Marquis, because we, have, we are noble, we are noble in Tuscany. The Marquis Nicolò Incisa della Rocchetta from Tuscany as well, the entrepreneur. So what happened? It happened that Mr. Antonio Pilloni, the wine entrepreneur that was living in Sardinia, that was born in Sardinia, he had the vision. He saw the potential of his land, 
And he saw the potential of this incredible area that could make red wines that could be aged for a long time and they could compete with the best wines from Italy and from all over the world. So he called the best winemaker that we've ever had in Italy, the wine guru, Mr. Giacomo Takis. Hey Vince, I can see your bat from North Carolina. <laughs> okay. And the Marquis, Nicolò Incisa da Rocchetta, he is the big entrepreneur from Tuscany. And he, you know, he brought his skills, he invested his money, and he brought his know-how, know-how to run a business and to run a winery. Okay. The wine is from Agripunica, the name of the winery, Barrua, the most popular and important wine from Sardinia, as I mentioned before, IGT 2017. The grape, 2017. The grapes are Carignano, 85%, which is the main grape from this particular region. Cabernet Sauvignon, just a slight touch of it, 10%, and a 5% of Merlot. Aging for 18 months in French barrique, like his Tuscan brother Sassicaia. Altitude is 300 meters above sea level. The soil is clay, sand, and calcareous schist. First vintage of this wine was 2002 when these three incredible men uh, decided to start this project together. Alcohol percentage, we're pretty high up in alcohol, 15%. Price is 52 euros. Here we are. Agripunica Barrua, 2017. Yep. Yeah. Okay, let's see the color first. Another red ruby color. This one has a brighter light compared to the first one. Uh, that means, you know, it shows sign of, signs of freshness as well. The nose, incredible, overwhelming intensity. I can just smell it from, you know, one meter apart. Incredible complexity, uh, incredible intensity, incredible complexity which is something you don't find often in, in, in wines. When you have complexity and intensity, it is, it is pretty, pretty amazing. It means that the wine is amazing. Yeah, so there's a predominant aspect of uh, black cherry, like a black cherry, dark cherry, black cherry under spirit, and chocolate as well here. Um, you know, uh, not just chocolate, but those pralines with Chocolate on the outside and Ron and a cherry on the inside. We have a lot of them here in Italy. My parents were actually feeding, feeding me those pralines when I was a kid. This explains everything. Whether you become a sommelier or an alcoholic when this happens in such an early stage of your life. Um, yeah, it reminds me a lot of that. And also a uh, red rose aspect to it. Licorice. I smell licorice here and um, uh, myrrh as well. Myrrh is a typical plant from Sardinia that is, you know, very famous for the liquor myrrh, myrto from Sardinia. Just to make you understand, if you never tasted it, it's like in, in, in Amalfi Coast, they have limoncello. In Sardinia, they have myrrh, which is this myrto di Sardinia in English, I think is myrrh, myrrh. It's this beautiful, this beautiful like balsamic note and herbal note of, you know, also I can say rosemary, rosemary here, rosemary here as, as well. Yeah, extremely elegant and complex. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful smell. Let's see the palette of it. Okay. Very generous as well. You can feel the alcohol in this one too. Uh, succulent and savory as well with a beautiful mineral finish. Um, it has a dangerous drinkability for a 15% volume of alcohol wine. Because when you, when, when you drink a 15% volume of alcohol that you, know, you can be happy with one glass is one thing. This one has got a beautiful drinkability 
compulsive drinkability that makes it very dangerous because you can finish the whole bottle and then you realize that you're drinking a 15% volume of alcohol wine. Uh, very perfectly balanced with a perfect uh, freshness to it as well. Beautiful elegance with a firm uh, tannin that is perfectly integrated in a savory, long-lasting finish. The wine has an incredible, incredible persistency in the mouth with beautiful notes of cherry, pepper, kind of a spicy note, and, and sage as well. Sage and rosemary as well. A great wine indeed. I think that, you know, I can confirm that this is one of the top wines in Sardinia and in Italy as well. So spot on, amazing, amazing bread. Of course, this can be aged for 20, 30 years from now, but it's very beautifully enjoyable even now. So food-wise, I think the perfect pairing will be with roasted pork, which is typical from Sardinia. They call it uh, porcedu. Stews and, you know, game and roasted meat in general. I think this go, goes really well with the barbecue. Amazing, amazing wine of incredible, incredible quality. I'm very happy with that. I think I'm going to finish, finish the bottle when this tasting is over. <laughs> I try to, you know, I try to get it together now because I'm drinking too much wine. So probably if I start talking too much of talking nonsense, just stop me. If you guys have any questions, I'm more than happy to to reply your questions, any doubts, any, your impressions about the wines that we've tasted so far. And then we move into the last wine, to the dessert wine. Janine, any questions on your part? Hey, we have a question here. Sure. Hi. You, you, you were talking about limoncello and you said okay. something is similar to limoncello. What, what was the comparison? Oh yeah, uh, there's a liquor that is typical from Sardinia. It's like, you know, in Naples you have limoncello. In Sardinia they have this liquor that they always eat, they always drink after lunch, after a meal. It's called mirth, mirto. Here. It's, uh, it's like a herb. It's like uh, one of those herbs. It's very similar to rosemary. It's in between rosemary and sage. Is it? Just love it. This kind of herbal note that reminds me a lot of that, but uh, it's difficult to explain how the mirth tastes like, but it's similar to, it's in between rosemary and sage. It's something very typical from Mediterranean, Mediterranean climate. So uh, does it taste better than ouzo? Similar. On certain aspects, yeah. It, it, good is point. It less, is it less um, licorice-y or it like more on the rosemary side? Like it's liquor. more on the herb. It's more on the herbal side. More okay. on the herbal side. I'm in yeah. the garden thinking about it. Is it Pardon clear, me? Francesco? Is it clear? The the spirits? Yeah. No, it's 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 dark. Oh. It's dark. It's like usually it's like a digestive usually like a digestive uh, spirit that we that we drink is spreading all over uh, Europe as well in, 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 in the UK is like a big fashion to to drink mirth because Sardinians are you know people from Sardinia they used to travel a lot so uh, now they, they they are traveling all over the UK because of unemployment pretty much in Sardinia and all over Italy but the fact that oh, now that I mentioned this, uh, and I mentioned Sardinian cheese before, uh, you know the pecorino cheese from Pienza, the ones that have been here to Tuscany know that close to Montepulciano you have Pienza, which is famous for the sheep cheese. We have to thank Sardinians that emigrated from Sardinia, the shepherds, because they have a big tradition of shepherds. They came to Tuscany and they brought their, they, they, they came here with their own sheets and they started to make pecorino cheese. So we owe them a lot if we have a lot of, if these areas famous for, for cheese. Any other questions for you guys? We have an amazing uh, dessert wine as grand finale. 
I brought in the big guns, the big glass, you know how fancy this is. <laughs> you don't need such a big glass for this wine because this wine has incredible, you know, power. Let's see if I manage to open the bottle. Yeah, this is Berrier 2018 from Donna Fugata. So we are talking about the two most important, the two most important um, dessert wines in Italy are the Vinsanto from Avignonesi, from here from Montepulciano, that many of you guys have tasted already, especially the guys from the guys from uh, Utah. They have tasted this wine, this beautiful Vinsanto from Montepulciano already. And the other most important dessert wine of Italy is probably Ben Benerie. This one is called Benrie from Donna Fugata. This wine is incredible, unbelievable. One of my favorite wines in the world. The wine that gave me, you know, the epiphany. When I started to approach wine, I had an epiphany with this wine. These and another couple of great wines, the first time that I tasted them, I was, you know, so impressed. I was so overwhelmed by the quality of these wines that I decided that, you know, my path is going to be to become a sommelier and to be able to express what I feel in the glass, express my emotions, my feelings when I taste a wine that I like a lot. So I'm very, I get very emotional that now I get to share this one with you guys. So I hope that we, you will enjoy it as much as I did the first time and every time that I actually taste it. Okay, I share my screen. Here we are. We are way down south. See, this is Italy right here in the map. This is Sicily. The one that I'm pointing now is at La Volcano. This is the third wine that we have tasted, the wine region. And this one is, this is the, the island of Pantelleria. This is Tunisia, just to give you an idea on how close to Africa we are. We're very close to Africa. African, African climate as well, very dry, very warm and dry climate. Very interesting and very fascinating lands. Let's go to the next slide. See these beautiful pictures. These are the vines of Pantelleria, the vineyards of Pantelleria, of the island uh, of Pantelleria, of the wine that we have tasting now, that we are tasting now, Benrie. You see mostly volcanic stones. They built these walls to protect the soil from erosion. So we're talking about heroic viticulture. Heroic viticulture is done in just a few parts of a few parts of Europe, some islands in Greece, the islands in Sicily, the north of Italy by the mountains, the Etna volcano as well. Heroic viticulture means that all the work is done by hand, by the man. No tractors can go in these incredibly steep slopes. It is a really hard work. And usually they build these kind of walls with the stones you can find in these places where they practice heroic, heroic viticulture. And it's a really hard job. It's a really hard job because if you don't like this wine, you don't have to tell it to me. You're gonna ruin my dreams of, you know, the early, the, the Francesco, the sommelier that was approaching wine for the first time when he was 20 years old. It's not, not just killing my dreams. You just uh, saying bad things about the hard work of these people they are doing. Because think about to protect, in order to protect the soil from erosion, these people, they have to carry the stones to build the walls, everything on their back. So it is a really hard work. So if you don't like the wine, don't tell them because they will get really angry about this because they work very hard. So this one on the bottom side on the left, to the left, is the Alberello Pantese, the vine typical from Pantelleria. Alberello means little tree. 
So they're like little trees, very different from any other vines that will be able you'll be able to see in the United States or in Italy, in Tuscany as well. Very low, so even harder job to harvest these grapes because you have to you have to bend over and they're very low into the soil, really hard work. And they are usually into the dig holes around them to protect them, to shelter them from the strong winds that you have from, from the sea. And here on the right side, you see the dried grapes and they have to clean them by hand from the stems and to select the best, the best grapes. So it is a really hard work. Let's see a few technical information about this wine. Donna Fugata, Berrier, 2018. Grapes are 100% Zibibo, which is like a Moscato, typical from Sicily. Drying, the drying takes part for 50% of the grapes, only one month, not that long. They usually harvest in, middle, in, in the middle of August, earlier than usual harvest, to keep the acidity within the grapes. Then they dry them for 50, for sorry, for 30 days, usually four weeks in stray mats. And the other 50% of the grapes are not dry, just a regular uh, harvest to keep a beautiful balance, a beautiful acidity to the wine. Aging is done for eight months in stainless steel. As I mentioned before, the wine is done with the, is made with heroic viticulture techniques. So hard work, everything is done by hand. Soil is volcanic, lava, and sand, because uh, Pantelleria is a volcanic island, was born from a volcano, is a former volcano. First vintage of this wine is 1989. Average age of vines is up to 110 years old. Pretty unbelievable. Pantelleria is another place where Phylloxera, the wine plant, didn't make it to Pantelleria because it was too far farther away. So the insect didn't spread there and the vine survived for a very long time. Alcohol percentage, 14.3%. Residual sugar, almost 200 grams per liter. So think about what you're drinking. 20% of what you're drinking is sugar. But it's, it's not going to be too sweet, I promise. Price is 46 euros for the half bottle. That is my face again. Yeah, we go with the wine. Again, Donna Fugata. The third one we have tasted from Sicily was made by this winery, and they have a different location in this beautiful, this beautiful island. See the color? The color is, I see the gold of the Sicilian sun here. I don't want to exaggerate. I don't want to be always like, you know, Italian. We exaggerate everything. We drama queenize everything we, we, we describe. But I see the gold of, you know, the Sicilian, the Sicilian sun with amber reflex, like golden, amber, beautiful, beautiful color. With luminous color as well. You see, the color is very luminous. If you are used to Vinsanto from, from, from Tuscany, you don't have this bright color. The bright color is due to the freshness, to the acidity of it. So I'm expecting something that is not too sweet, but it's got nice balance and nice acidity. So let's see, let's see the, the, the smell first. Unbelievable, overwhelming intensity. Uh, beautiful quality of all the aromas. You know, all the aromas are perfectly carved in this masterpiece. We are tasting the Michelangelo of dessert wine. I promise you that. Uh, a wine that is unique. Uh, uh, I'm getting emotional. Just This is the thou thousands time that I've tasted this wine. It still surprises me every time. Uh, you know, you have uh, this beautiful, beautiful smell of dried apricot, like candied orange peel as well, this kind of orange aspect, aspect to it. Dehydrated peach, uh, almost like an exotic fruit like uh, dates, something like from Africa, from sub-Saharan uh, uh, regions like dates and dried figs. 
a note of a sweet note of honey as well, uh, beautiful, and also Mediterranean scrub as well here, like kind of a sage, herbal touch, touch to it. Beautiful, beautiful. My my, you know, the aroma is addictive. My nose just keeps going into the glass because I can't help it. The 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 aroma is so good, so complex, so amazing that I keep smelling it without stopping. Let's taste it. Wow. I want to cry now of happy tears of happiness. Intense, smooth, fulfilling aroma. Very fulfilling. My whole mouth, my, my taste buds, I'm like, okay, Francesco. Now that's it. This is the one we want to drink for the rest of our lives. Um, Amazing, extremely, extremely pleasant. You don't feel, well, of course it is sweet, but you don't feel the 200 grams per liter uh, here. It's not too sweet. It's sweet, but it's got nice freshness, nice acidity, nice acidity to it. Uh, and also savor as well. There's kind of a like a, a salty finish to it, which is typical from the volcanic soil as well as well as the first two wines we have tasted. It is, you know, beautiful. And the finish is very long. The persistency is never ending with this incredible succulent feeling of dried apricots again. And, uh, you know, these uh, dried figs and dates. Beautiful, beautiful wine. We are talking about the, you know, the Michelangelo, as I said, the dessert wine. We're talking about, you know, this is the Michael Jordan. We are we we are dealing with Ayrton Senna, with Hussein Bolt, with you know, you know, with Serena Williams. We are just reaching the top of the top of Italian dessert wines, I think. Um yeah, I'm just I'm I'm just excuse me, but I'm just you know, I'm just so happy to taste a wine that I like so much and to share with you guys. This is the whole goal that I had when I started this, you know, the wine club, when I started to become a sommelier, to study. The goal was to be able to share the emotions I have, what I'm feeling with you guys and to enjoy with you guys. Yeah. Yeah, the food pairing, I think is going to be perfect pairing. It's going to be blue cheese. You'd be very surprised. Uh, fruit tart and chocolate, uh, chocolate ganache as well. A very extreme wine pairing. If you come to Tuscany, I promise I will open a bottle of this or Vinsanto as well. The liver, pork liver, which is typical from here. My mother makes the most amazing pork liver ever. An incredible pairing that no one knows about except from we from Tuscany. It's pork liver and dessert wine. This is something, I mean, French, the French people, they eat foie gras with dessert wine, with sauterne usually. We drink pork liver or chicken livers with with the with this. It sounds gross, but it's the like the predominant dish that we have in in, in Tuscany. Okay, guys, um, just one second. I'm gonna share the screen, so I'm gonna show you the wine lineup that we enjoyed. Then I'm more than happy to share your impressions and your questions. So as you guys know, free shipping to the USA and to Germany as well. The ones we have tasted, the first one is Cottanera Calderara, 32 euros. Cottanera, the white wine. The first red was Cottanera Feudo di Mezzo, di Etna, 36 euros. The third wine, Donna Fugata, Tancredi, IGT 2017, 38 euros. The fourth one, the first one from Sardinia, Argiolas, Corem, IGT 2017, the fifth one, the Barua, the most popular wine from Sardinia, from the winery Agripunica, 2017, 52 euros a bottle. And the last one, Donna Fugata, Ben Rie, 2018, 46 euros for the half bottle. The deals, 12 bottles combined. So two bottles of each of these wines, you have 40, uh, sorry, 465 euros. 12 bottles of your choice, you have minus 5%. 24 bottles of your choice, 10%, minus 10%, 36 bottles or more, 
you have 10% discount and a free dinner and wine tasting in Montepulciano at Osteria de Borgo, which I hope it will be soon. I hope to see you guys again very soon here in Montepulciano. Okay. More than happy, you guys can feel free to ask me anything. And if you have any questions about the wines and the tasting we've had so far. I just want to say I loved it. Oh, we loved it. Thank oh. you. Thank you. Thank you. We want to come for the uh, unusual when pairing. Come? When can we come next? Yeah, well, 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 you guys have to come here, and I promise, I promise we'll we'll do the unusual pairing. Oh, I promise we'll come for sure. sure. Yeah. Because I remember when you guys were here, we had a huge Barolo tasting, yeah. an incredible wow. vertical from 1962 up to you know, wow. Yeah, that, we still talk about that. We yeah, can't. me too. So yeah, we're thinking November. That'd be awesome. <laughs> That'd be yeah. awesome. Hey, do you still have the video of us all singing in the bus? Yes, I do. But I'm not going to show it now because oh, no. people, people would judge. But oh, maybe, so maybe email it. Maybe email it to us. For sure. I, I can WhatsApp it to Vince. Okay. So I will send it by WhatsApp. Okay, perfect. Yep. Thank you so much for having us. This is great. Oh, you guys are great. You guys are amazing. And you really, I was supposed, so the first, uh, the, my, my, my goal is to go back to the United States as well. Like it, we did in 2019 with the guys from the guys from North Carolina, from Raleigh, we did an amazing event in, 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 in Raleigh. And, and it was, it was beautiful to have. We filled up a restaurant with 60 guests. Thanks to this amazing guy with the green shirt. My brother from another mother, Vince, Vince Ayamuno. Uh, with these guys, we, we filled in, we filled up a restaurant. So I really hope to be able to go back to the United States soon. And I promise we'll go to Salt Lake City to visit you guys. Yeah. And uh, well, and also Janine, everything okay on your side? Janine, here you are. Hi. Hi. How are you guys doing in Rhode Island? Oh, hey. Bravo. Thank Bravo. You. Thank you, guys. You guys are amazing. Oh. It's easy with, with you guys. You guys are amazing. Very kind. Thank you, Francesca. Thank you. Thank you. So with Janine, she was in for the amazing wine tasting week before COVID happened in February 2020. Some of the members of the wine club, they came here to Montepulciano and we did the Brunello di Montalcino preview of the 2015 vintage. The Vino Nobile wine tasting here in Montepulciano with the, all the wineries with the 2017 vintage and the Chianti Classico preview in Florence. It was spectacular. I remember back, back then, Janine, we were talking about COVID like it was something far away in China. Yes. <laughs> then you yeah. guys... You guys made it back to the United States by miracle because Italy was the first country to be hit by the virus in the Western world. Uh, they announced uh, martial law the day we were leaving. That's crazy. <laughs> That's crazy. I bet people, when it came back to Rhode Island, people were like, no, stay away from me. I don't want it. Like, you, you were in Italy yesterday. You just stay yes. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Vince from North Carolina. Thank you guys from Rhode Island. Thank you guys very much. Hey, Vince. Thank you. Well, Thank you. Uh, from North Carolina. Hey, you guys. That's Baba there. Oh, thanks, Vince. And Michael and Nula, thank you very much. I kept you awake for you know, this evening. Thank you very much. I'm sure I will see you. I will see you very soon. Also, Stephanie Strollo as well. She's via Facebook. And Chris and Annette Bear, thank you, guys very much from Atlanta. These will be seen in Atlanta as well by um, the Carme family. They couldn't make it for today, but they'll watch the recorded version with the amazing, amazing cheese and ham platters. 
by her daughter, her daughter Gianna, which is a really good friend of mine. So yeah, hello to everyone else. Yeah, Baba is there. Hey, Baba, how you doing, brother? That's right there. That's my man. And well, thank you guys very much. If you have any other questions, I'll be more than happy. Otherwise, that's it. <laughs> so Francesco, I thought I was the only American Vince in your life, but to find out there's another Vince, like, <laughs> I, I, don't, I mean, oh, don't be jealous. <laughs> don't be jealous. I hate him. I hate him. <laughs> bro, bro, don't be jealous. I have two brothers in the United States called Vince. We need to be friends, man. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm sure you guys will get along really, really well. <laughs> That's, there's another, there's actually three Vins in, in my life. <laughs> so one, one is Vince, Vince's son in North Carolina, Vincenzo. Oh. Vincenzo. That's, that's my American, well, Italian American nephew. Man. Oh. That's, where's, where's Enzo? I'm number three. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm not even going to push it. Well, bro, you are number one always. <laughs> Like, like, you say that to all the girls. Yeah, you say that to all the Vinces. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, you're just like, I got a Vince here. I got a Vince there. You know what? I, have, I have a Vince in every city in the United States, right? <laughs> okay, other Vince. We're also from Atlanta, though. No, he's in North Carolina. Oh, are you guys from Atlanta as well? Yeah, yeah, you're right. You're right. He's in Atlanta. I thought he was in North Carolina. No, no, oh, no. no. We, we were raised in Atlanta, went to school in Atlanta. Yeah. Well, we have a lot of friends in Atlanta as well. We, we did an event there. We did a beautiful wine tasting and wine dinner in Atlanta as well. It was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. Okay. There was, a state, there was a state senator as well, which- A I state senator? senator. Oh. Wow, fancy. In, in Raleigh, we had the mayor of Raleigh. Yeah, Vincent, Vincent, I think. Well, well Vincent is the king of Raleigh. <laughs> Francesco, what happened to Lionel? Yeah, this is uh, ugly, ugly news from Montalcino we received a few, a few weeks ago. Lionel, the owner of Cupano, one of the most important wineries, in, one of my favorite wineries in Montalcino that we, we uh, visited with the guys from Utah. Well, bye, bye, North Carolina, bye, Riley. Love bye. you guys. Bye, Vincent Candance, bye, Enzo. So with the guys from... Uh, Utah, we visited this beautiful wine remote Alcino Cupano, and Lionel unfortunately passed away uh, three weeks ago. Really sad news. He was a very special, very special guy. Uh, one of the best people in the wine business in, in Italy, I would say. So very sad news, but you know, this is the cycle of life. His legacy will live forever through his incredible wines and through his you know, wife Ornella and the, the his kids, amazing kids, and through um, Andrea Polidoro, a really good friend of mine who works at the winery. Yeah, sad news, but you know, do they think we'll that, drink wine? To are they gonna, memory. Are they, any word as far as like, are they going to keep the winery going or? Pardon me. Are they going to keep the winery going? Yes, yes. The That's winery good. is in really great hands. Because Andrea, Andrea is like, you know, he learned everything. The guy that, the tall guy that was there when we did the tasting, he learned everything about wine by Lionel. You know, Lionel is one of those winemakers that I like very much. He's not, he's not only a skilled winemaker, but there's always, you know, wine is always a fascinating matter. Uh, because 98% of, I always say 98% of the wine what we are drinking in the glass, 98% of it can be explained by science. There's a 2% of mystery, of magic, of, I don't know, something magical to the wine that cannot be explained. And Lionel, he was a master on that 2% of that, you know, kind of this beautiful figure talking about philosophy. You could talk about philosophy, religious matters, uh, wine, foods, football, whatever, for 
hours and hours drinking, sharing a good bottle of wine. This is the kind of winemakers that I always want to talk about in the Perbaco Wine Club. So, you know, yeah, we just, to the memory of Lionel, I always drink a good glass of red wine. Oh, yeah, this is the guy. Amazing guy. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm very overwhelmed and happy that he left you guys a very good, such good memory. We met him for one day and I reported what Vince wrote me via WhatsApp when I told him about the sad news. I reported your beautiful, beautiful words to Andrea and to Ornella, the wife of Lionel, and they were very moved and happy about this. So I'm very happy that he left such an incredible memory. Oh, it, was, it was an unbelievable experience. I mean, like you said, yeah, like I just know. that whole, how he transcended just taking wine or food or whatever, you know, into that, that artistic space. It was like, passionate. Oh, it was so exactly. Cool. Yeah, it was, it's a beautiful thing. Yeah, exactly. It's not often that a French guy is so loved <laughs> by Italians. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't happen really often. So you yeah. gotta be, you gotta be a special guy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions, you guys? We can't wait to see you. Oh, we can't that wait was to a come. statement, but <laughs> not a question, but a not statement. A question, but a statement. We're excited to see your face in person, and we're glad you guys have survived a very difficult year and a half. And we're very. Ah, uh, it was hard. <laughs> I'm not hiding that. Italy got hit pretty hard. Uh, you guys know a lot about the virus. Uh, you know how you feel when you get the virus. You know when people that you know really well, that you love, they, they get hit by this stupid, awful virus. Uh, but, um, you know, the economy was hit pretty hard. Now, luckily, the, the vaccination campaign is taking off now. So we're going back to normal. Also, with higher temperatures now, we're opening it up. And our business, I'm talking from obviously a business perspective, we've had a really challenging couple of years because we've been closed for four months in the first, uh, in the first uh, um, wave in March 2020, like three and a half months. And now we've been closed for six months on oh, the wow. second wave. Brutal. So mm. we couldn't open the restaurant, even like, for instance, tonight, the restaurant, we can op only open outdoors seating. But we are pretty high in altitude in Montepulciano. We are on the top of the hill, so it can get pretty windy. And we are living, we are experiencing, experiencing the coldest May in like 100 years. Oh, no. <laughs> so oh. even tonight, we had plenty of reservations for the restaurant, but it started to rain. So oh. we are heritage, you know, heritage building, so you cannot cover you cannot build any fences or cover the outdoor seatings. So if it starts to rain or the weather gets too cold, you have to turn people away. Or you put food in a doggy bag and they have to eat it in the hotel. Sucks. But still, it is an amazing feeling to be able to work again, to be back at work. Because six months without working for us, workaholic, my <laughs> family, it was, it, it was hard. Luckily... We had the online tastings that were a big success, the ones that we did in November and November, December, and yeah, November and December. They were big success. They were a lot of fun. Like this one is, it was for me, it was a great fun. Uh, so, and the wine club as well, we managed to work and to do business even in such an awful moment of, of our economy. So we're happy with that. And also we, I'm happy that all the members of my, my family, they, they are okay, they're safe, you know, all the people that I know are safe. So this is the most important thing, our good health. And then the rest is just, just money. Yeah, yeah, we've been worried about you. We're so glad you guys are doing, you're safe and healthy. And we can't wait to eat at your restaurant again, though. <laughs> yeah, pork liver and the third wine. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully there's a few more courses in there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah of course. That is going to be like the grand finale of the dinner. Probably. Which I've never had before. <laughs> so, yeah, just a few things about the upcoming tastings on, again, on June, uh, Sunday, June 13th, we have 
Italian white wines and orange wines. Something like we did with you guys from Utah here in multiple channel. Beautiful to find out on uh, or, uh, how orange wine is orange wine is made. And the last tasting on Sunday, June the 20th is gonna be sparkling wines. The difference in between Champenoise method and Prosecco method. So I'll see you on the next tastings. I hope you enjoyed. I hope I didn't talk too much as usual. Thank you guys. Thank you, Michael and Nula. Thanks, Malia, Vince. Thank you. Thank you guys very much. Thank you, Francesco. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Wonderful. I love you. I love Bye. you. Good time. Thank you guys. Bye. Love Have you, good family. Night. See ya. Ciao. 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 Ciao.